Welcome back to our introduction in anatomy and physiology. The next few systems that we're going to have a look at, we're going to touch in much less detail than we did the previous systems. And that's just because of the nature and the requirements for this course um, tends to lead us to really focus in on the respiratory, cardiovascular and the nervous system. Um, and then the other systems just to touch on more lightly. So we're firstly going to be having a look at the skeletal system and we're going to cover off on the functions of the skeletal system, the different divisions and naming the bones of the skeleton. Some of the functions of the skeletal system include aiding in movement. Our muscles, our ligaments and our tendons help us to move the way that we do. We have bones that protect vital organs. The cranium protects the brain, the spinal vertebra protect the spinal cord running down the back. We have the pelvic cavity protecting all the reproductive organs and the thoracic cavity which protects our vital organs such as our heart, our great vessels and our lungs. Our skeleton provides our shape and our structure and our framework to our body. We look the way that we do because the of the formation of our particular skeleton. The skeleton or the bones are a site of production for different types of blood cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets are all formed within the bone and the bone marrows. The skeletal system also has the capability of storing certain minerals and they, they store these minerals to be used for later on and these include things such as magnesium, zinc, iron, phosphorus and very importantly calcium. There are two divisions of the skeletal system. The first is the axial skeleton that you can see colored in yellow on the diagram and the next is the appendicular skeleton which is colored in green. The axial skeleton consists of the cranium and the facial bones, the neck and the spine, the thoracic cavity and the base of the pelvis. The appendicular skeleton consists of the upper and the lower limbs and the girdles that they are connected into the trunk with. Having a closer look at the cranial and facial bones, here's some terms that you need to start getting familiar with and starting to remember. So firstly, looking at the cranium or the skull. The front part of the skull over here, um, you can see that's the eye socket over there. This is called the frontal bone and the lobe of the brain that's underneath here is called the frontal lobe of the brain. The parietal bone is what runs off of that at the top of the head as we get round to the back. The very back part of the skull that you feel just before connecting with the neck is called the occipital bone and you may have heard of parts of the brain called the occipital lobe and that's the lobe that lies directly underneath here. The temporal bone is the bone that runs alongside on the left and right hand side of the head where the ear connects onto. Looking further on down to the facial bones, bones to remember, the nasal bone, the zygomatic bone or zygoma, that's the cheekbone, the top part of the jaw which is called the maxilla and the bottom part of the jaw called the mandible. Moving on down to the thorax, we've mentioned already in the beginning parts of um, or going through other systems in these PowerPoints is the sternum. So the breastbone on the chest is called the sternum and the sternum is divided into three bits. There's the manubrium, the very top part of the sternum, the body of the sternum and the xiphoid process or what's also called the ziphy sternum. Running off parts of the sternum and connected by cartilage are the 12 ribs. Uh, two of these ribs, however, are not connected to the sternum and they're called floating ribs. That's a rib 11 and 12 over here. But every single one of our ribs is connected onto a thoracic vertebra running on the posterior section or the back. 
um, and they help to enclose the ribs and create this thoracic cavity. At the most superior portion of the thoracic cavity is the clavicles and the clavicles then articulate with the upper limbs. The arms or the upper limbs are connected to the thoracic cavity via the clavicle and the scapula. Connected onto the scapula is the humerus, which is the long bone in the upper arm. And as we move down, then past the elbow joint, then there are two bones. So in all limbs, the upper portion of a limb has a single bone in it, and the lower portion of the limb has two bones there. So running along the thumb side is the bone called the radius and running along the inside of that is the ulna bone. So with somebody standing in anatomical position, fingers splayed, palms face forwards to the front of the body, the thumb and the radius should always be on the same side. The radius and the ulna articulate with the bones of the wrist. So all the small bones over here in the wrist are called the carpals. They extend out into longer bones called the metacarpals. Those are, the, those are the bones that you see in your hand going out to your knuckles over here. And then the bones that extend from your knuckles out, which we would normally call fingers, have a very strange name. They're called phalanges. There are multiple vertebrae which make up the neck and the spine and they're all labeled and called um, by the region that they're present in. So we have seven cervical vertebrae over here in the neck. Then there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, all of which are connected to a rib that form the thoracic cavity. We have five lumbar vertebrae. Then five fused vertebrae that make up the sacrum, which is the back of the pelvis and the coccyx. The sacrum and the coccyx form the back portion of the pelvis or pelvic cavity. So the sacrum is connected to both sides of the ilium, which are your hip bones. And if you have a feel the front of your hip bones, you can feel what's called the iliac crest. This is this upper portion over here. The ilium are continuous with the pubis bone, which connects in the middle to form the pubis symphysis, and the bone that runs at the back. And when you're sitting down, you can feel that bone protruding um, just underneath the buttock, and that's called the ischium. The pelvis is connected to the lower limbs by this ball and socket joint, and that's called the acetibulum. The head of the femur then extends out to the neck and the greater trochanter. And then we have this long femur bone, which is our thigh bone, which articulates with our patella or our kneecap. And then the tibia running down the toe side of the leg and the fibula running on the outside of the leg. Moving down to the ankle joint, we have tarsals which are the small bones which make up the ankle joint well numerous bones which make up the ankle joint the metal tarsals which are these longer bones reaching out towards our toes and then our toes which are called our phalanges we'll move straight into the muscular system and we'll discuss the different functions of the muscular system the classifications of muscle tissue and also have a look at some of the anatomy of skeletal muscle. The primary functions of the muscular system involve movement, whether it be internally or externally or conscious or subconscious movements. These would include things such as breathing, so an involuntary muscular movement, although it can be overridden by our voluntary mus um, nervous system. Breathing um, involves contraction of muscles such as our intercostal muscles and our diaphragm and then the accessory muscles of respiration when breathing starts to need to be more labored or increased. It gives us the capability of communicating not only with our body language but also the, the unique ability to talk. Muscles are very important in the whole process of digestion. Different muscles contract forming the 
um, wave-like motion of peristalsis through our digestive tract, as well as the different muscles in our stomach and through our intestines with help to churn up food and mechanically break it down for absorption. Movement of our skeleton. So our muscular system with our skeletal system gives us the capabilities of moving and functioning the way that we do. And muscle movement is what enables our heart to beat and to pump blood around our body. Our blood vessel walls are also controlled by muscular movement. This gives them the capability to constrict and to dilate and push blood into different areas or redirect blood to different areas of the body. Skeletal muscle is one of the primary um, contributors to the heat production in our body and this is what is able to set our core temperature is because of all the muscle mass in our body all of those cells undergoing cellular respiration and producing heat as a byproduct is what keep our, keeps our core temperature so nice and warm. So having a look at the different divisions or classifications of our different types of muscle in the body we have our skeletal muscle which is the muscle which is attached onto our bones. We have cardiac muscle, which is the muscle which is the specialized type of muscle that we find in the heart. And then we have smooth muscle, which lines most of our hollow organs. So most of the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, and our cardiovascular system is all lined by smooth muscle cells. And this is what um, the different types of muscle cells look like underneath a microscope. Well, this is a, a drawn um, diagram over here of what they do look like under a microscope. And you can see they all have just a slightly different shape and structure to them. And that's what allows them to provide the specific functions that each type of muscle provides. This is a diagram which depicts the anatomy of skeletal muscles. So, before in the previous picture you saw what skeletal muscle looked like underneath a microscope and each one of those tiny muscle fibers clumps together to form muscle bundles which is protected by a sheath, a clear sheath that surrounds and protects the muscle and keeps it uniform and in shape. And that then extends down with the muscle fibers to form this connective tissue tendon, which connects onto our bones. So when these muscles, um, muscle groups and muscle fibers all contract, they would pull on the tendon and pull the bone in the direction that they would like to move. This concludes our introduction to the musculoskeletal system. If you do have any questions or queries about this, please don't hesitate to contact us. There's one more video to follow, concluding our introduction to anatomy and physiology.